All right, welcome everybody to Why Should Healthcare Professionals Care About Climate Change? A conversation with healthcare without harm. This is part of our virtual Earth Day celebration happening now through April 30th. This is our third and final week. Um, it is hosted by HSC Sustainability, which is part of facilities management and it's funded by our students. And just a reminder that if you want to learn more about our virtual Earth Day celebration, you can go to unthc.edu slash Earth Day and students and employees can get this free water bottle for participating. So just go on there and learn some more. And I do want to introduce Dr. Amy Collins to you today. She is a practicing emergency medicine physician and sustainable healthcare professional in Boston suburbs. She founded the Sustainability Committee at the Metro West Medical Center in 2007 and led those efforts for seven years. And under her leadership, the Metro West Medical Center received numerous environmental excellence awards from Practice Green Health. If you're not familiar with Practice Green Health, please Google them. Um, the Environmental Leadership Circle Award, which is the most prestigious award that they offer. She also worked as a sustainable healthcare consultant for Vanguard Health Systems and implemented sustainability programs at all 26 hospitals nationwide. And she now serves as a senior clinical advisor for physician engagement for Healthcare Without Harm, leading their physician network with the goal to support physicians and medical students who are interested in promoting climate smart healthcare and climate solutions. She was actually just mentioning how there are lots of um, students and physicians who talk about climate change, so we're happy to have her. This is a talk we've wanted to long since do, and I'm very happy to have you, Dr. Collins. And just a reminder to all the participants, you can um, write in the chat box. We'll have a little bit of time for Q&A afterwards, and Dr. Collins is more than happy to share her information with you if you have questions afterwards. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Can you see, see my slides now? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, for that um, kind introduction and for inviting me uh, to speak to all of you today. It really is um, a pleasure to get to meet with you. Um, so I'm gonna start with a story about how I um, became engaged in this work. My journey started back in 2007. I was in the school pickup line in my car waiting to pick up my fourth grade son. I was idling and texting and listening to music. And my fourth grader came out, opened the door and immediately reprimanded me for idling. He told me that his teacher had read him a story about climate change and the impact it was having on polar bears and that he never wanted to catch me idling again and that I needed to take action on climate change because he was concerned. I didn't know anything about climate change, um, but I agreed uh, to him that I would um, take action. Um, my, really, my only point of reference about climate change was the Al Gore documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. So that night as a family, we watched it, and then we set out to make our home as sustainable as possible by doing things such as having a backyard garden, um, drying our clothes on a clothes line, doing an energy efficiency audit. And soon it became very uncomfortable living one way at home in an entirely different way at work. I started to wonder why I left my environmental conscious at the door when I walked in for an emergency department shift. I started noticing all the waste and inefficiencies. I started um, looking into the garbage pails and noticing recyclables in them. And I started to wonder why when I walked in to a shift at seven o'clock in the morning and there were no patients there, all the lights were on, all the TVs were on. So I um, got educated and then I asked someone if I could start a recycling program um, at a hospital, at my hospital, and I was told that recycling was illegal. So I then went to the internet and I typed in recycling in hospitals and I came across Healthcare Without Harm, which is the organization I now work for. Um, I then got even more educated and I learned that not only was recycling not illegal, but the, um, that healthcare had a big environmental footprint and there was a lot more a hospital could do to reduce its impact. I then um, continued my education and I um, wrote a letter to my administrative team asking for permission to start both a recycling program and a sustainability um, team and I was given instant permission. So, 
Um, my slides are not advancing. There we go. Um, so I led the sustainability work at Metro's Hospital for seven years, as Sandy mentioned. It was by far the most inspirational, enjoyable, fun, and impactful work I've ever done. Um, we had a director level sustainability team with administrative support. Um, and we implemented lots of programs in the area of waste reduction, energy efficiency, um, lots of employee and community education and engagement, um, also a lot of healthy food and healthcare work. Um, we had an on-site winter farmers market and we partnered with a local farm and had a, a employee and patient community supported agriculture um, program. But I no longer do that. I now work for Healthcare Without Harm which is a global organization that was founded in 1996 by Gary Cohen, who is still our president. Um, we work worldwide to transform um, the global healthcare sector so that it reduces its environmental footprint and becomes a community anchor for sustainability um, and a leader in the global movement for environmental health and justice. We have branches um, in four continents and our reach includes 44,000 hospitals and health centers in 72 countries worldwide. Um, Healthcare Without Harm started with a campaign to eliminate mercury um, from the healthcare sector. Um, you, a lot of you are probably young, um, but I'm older and I recall um, that we used to have lots of mercury in healthcare in our thermometers and blood pressure devices. Mercury is a very potent neurotoxin. So our initial campaign um, was to eliminate mercury from the US healthcare sector. And it ultimately led to a global treaty to eliminate mercury from the global healthcare sector. We have many program areas, healthy food and healthcare, safer chemicals, um, transportation, water, um, climate and health, waste and buildings, but our current focus is climate smart healthcare. So why are we focused on climate smart healthcare? Um, these are the messages I share when I speak to any um, healthcare audience. Um, this also provides a roadmap for my talk, and these are the messages that I want you to try and remember. Um, the first is that climate change impacts health. Um, extreme weather events can impact healthcare delivery, access, and supply chains. The healthcare sector contributes to climate crisis, which is ultimately against the um, oath to do no harm. And we also know that healthcare professionals can be very powerful advocates for climate solutions, including climate smart healthcare. So throughout my talk, I'm going to touch upon each of these messages, um, but none of them in great detail. Um, the intent of my talk is just to give you a high level overview about how I approach healthcare when, um, climate and health when I speak to healthcare audiences. Um, so climate change has broad implications on health. Um, in 2009, The Lancet, um, which is a British medical journal, referred to climate change as the greatest global health threat of the 21st century. Um, I think we all know that COVID um, is challenging that claim. Um, but as we say, um, there is no vaccine um, for the climate crisis. And as the COVID um, crisis um, continues, the climate crisis continues to um, accelerate it. Um, we now um, have um, what we call a climate health emergency in 2019. Um, around 140 medical and health organizations in the United States came together and declared a climate health emergency and really put out a call to action to the healthcare sector for us to leverage our influences and influence and voices um, to accelerate climate um, solutions um, to hopefully um, you know, reduce the worst impacts of climate change on health. Um, so how does climate change impact health? Um, this is a very commonly used infographic um, from the, the CDC. Um, in the center of this infographic is rising levels of CO2, um, which lead to climate um, um, drivers, um, which are rising temperatures, more extreme um, weather events, rising sea levels. Um, and then on the outer, the 
middle circle, um, you know, are exposures um, such as severe weather, air pollution, increasing allergens, impacts on water and food quality and supply, um, and extreme heat. And then um, the outer part of the infographic are the wide range um, of um, health outcomes, such as um, increasing heat-related illness, um, worsening and prolonged um, allergy seasons, um, changes in vector etiology, increased incidence of you know, tick-borne illness, a whole host um, of um, medical uh, health incomes, outcomes on health as a result of um, increasing levels of CO2. Um, some of the basics about climate change and health, um, climate change really threatens those basic things that we all need to be healthy, which is access to clean air, safe drinking water, healthy, nutritious food and shelter. Those health impacts can vary based on geographic location. Um, people in the West Coast, um, as we all know, um, have been exposed recently to wildfire smoke as a result of the wildfires in the West Coast, where on the East Coast, I am not likely to see those sort of health impacts. And all of you down in heck, Texas can see a whole different host of um, health impacts. Um, so again, um, that the health impacts um, vary dep depending on where you live. Um, uh, climate change is driven by combustion of fossil fuels. That same combustion of fossil fuels contributes to air pollution. Um, a study was recently published um, out of Harvard University in partnership with a number of other organizations that found that 18% of deaths worldwide are caused by air pollution. Um, and just basically want to touch upon that there is a link between climate change, um, racism, and environmental justice and that people in low income communities and people of color um, bear an excess pollution burden um, and they experience more air pollution exposure you know, than they cause. Um, so again, just a very basic um, overview of some of the different ways that climate change impacts um, the health of um, different patient populations. Um, climate change also has a disproportionate effect on um, vulnerable patient populations through three mechanisms, um, increased susceptibility, increased exposure, and limited ability to adapt, um, you know, such as children. The World Health Organization estimates that children bear 80% of the global impacts, health impacts of climate change, um, you know, certain occupational groups um, are um, more susceptible to the health impacts um, of extreme heat, um, you know, such as outdoor workers. Um, that little boy I talked to you about at the beginning, my son is now a 24 year old organic farmer. Um, and we know that farmers have increased incidence of heat related illness um, and kidney disease. Um, also climate change has a disproportionate impact on older adults. Um, for many reasons, um, such as um, their limited ability to adapt. Um, they may be on medications, which impair their ability to um, regulate heat. And they also might have a whole host of other medical problems. Um, and again, those communities with environmental justice concerns, um, you know, our homeless pipe, um, patient population, um, people with substance abuse, um, communities of color, and people who do not speak English. Um, and we also know that um, climate change, air pollution, and extreme heat can have impact on um, pregnancy outcomes, such as increased incidence of um, you know, low birth weight, um, stillbirth, and miscarriage. Um, I now want to talk about um, my second message um, to healthcare professionals, and that is the link between um, climate change, extreme weather events, um, and healthcare. Um, extreme weather events are increasing in severity and frequency. Um, this is a map of the billion dollar um, weather disasters in the United States in 2020. Um, it does not include the weather disaster that you all saw in Texas, um, you know, earlier this year with the deep freeze. Um, but these um, extreme weather events, again, they vary based on where you're located, 
um, but they have a huge economic impact and this economic impact does not include the health impacts. Um, so how can extreme weather impact healthcare delivery? I'm gonna start by sharing a um, brief case study about the impact that Superstorm Sandy had on NYU Langone um, Medical Center back in 2012. Um, I trained at NYU Langone, so I know it well. It is on the East River, of, East River of New York. And during Superstorm Sandy, there was a 14 foot storm surge that they were not pre prepared for. Um, greater than 15 million gallons of water um, flooded um, the basement of um, NYU Langone in a matter of half an hour. Um, the facility lost um, its electricity, lost their generators, um, which caused um, the need to evacuate over 300 patients, um, including critical care patients from NYU Langone in the dark, um, you know, without, uh, without electricity um, down stairwells. Um, this created a disruption to care. These patients had to be relocated um, to other hospitals, but the impact on NYU Langone didn't stop the day of the event. Um, it resulted in um, loss of equipment, um, you know, such as MRI machines. Um, they lost 10,000 um, carefully bred rodents. Uh, surgery was suspended at the hospital for two months, which impacted um, the ability of surgeons and surgical professionals to provide care to their patients, but it also impacted patients' ability to get the surgical care they need. Um, and the emergency department was ultimately closed for 18 months in part due to renovations. And um, ultimately 5,000 providers at the facility sought privileges at other hospitals. And it led um, to a big um, economic hit on the facility with an estimated loss of revenue of over $400 million. Um, so we work with hospitals to be resilient to extreme weather. Um, so that they can stay open and operational and able to serve um, their communities um, you know, during extreme weather at times when the communities need healthcare the most. Um, extreme weather can also impact um, access to healthcare. We talked about how it can it, um, affect the infrastructure, um, but it can also impact healthcare access. Um, communication systems might be down, so people might not be able to call 911. Um, transportation um, systems might be down, you know, subways, public um, transport might be impacted, roads might be closed. Um, the photo I share is from um, Colorado, a basic life support ambulance going to meet an advanced life so support ambulance to transport a patient to the hospital and the, hospital, the ambulance got caught in floodwaters. So when we talk about healthcare resilience, um, we really talk about the need for this to be um, in partnership with the community. We need to work with our communities um, to make sure that healthcare facilities can be uh, accessible, um, you know, open and operational during extreme weather events to serve their communities. Um, I wanna share a story about how this impacted a patient of mine. This was a couple of months ago. Um, last June, we in Massachusetts had an, a historic um, flood and a hospital in our community um, was flooded in a matter of minutes, forcing, a patient, uh, forcing patients to be evacuated. Um, that was last June. This hospital is still closed with estimates that it's gonna be closed in another, for another six months or so due to the incredible um, infrastructure damage. Um, it has caused providers to be out of work, um, including a former colleague of mine, um, and has forced colleagues to look for work elsewhere. But the story I wanna share is how this event impacted a patient of mine. So on a Friday evening, on a very busy night, an elderly male was dropped off at our emergency department, um, complaining of feeling poorly and having blood in his urine. Um, his previous care had been at this hospital, Norwood Hospital, but it was closed. Um, so his son dropped, us off, dropped him off at our hospital. 
He didn't speak English, which, pre which presented a challenge getting history from him. His son couldn't be there because of COVID, um, so couldn't help me translate. And I knew nothing about this patient's history. Normally what I would do is I would call a hospital and get old medical records, but I couldn't do that because the hospital is closed. So I was able to care for this patient, but in a very limited way because I was lacking in so much information um, because I could not access um, his medical records and I did not have his complete history. Um, extreme weather can also impact healthcare supply chains. Um, back in 2017, um, Hurricane Maria devastated um, the island of Puerto Rico. Um, and that impacted healthcare here in the United States. The two major manufacturing plants for normal saline um, IV bags were in Puerto Rico. And I recall getting a notice um, from my hospital saying that we had a critical shortage of normal saline IV bags and we needed to have alternate ways to give people hydration, um, such as giving them Gatorade, which we had stocked in our department. Um, also, um, there was a critical shortage of medications um, and drug supply following Hurricane Maria um, because her, um, Puerto Rico was also home to major pharmaceutical manufacturing plants um, and also manufacturing plants for surgical supplies. So this is an example of how extreme weather far from home um, can impact our ability to provide health care and care for our patients. Um, right here at home. Um, I often get asked to share a story um, about a patient I've seen that's impacted um, from by climate change. Um, and I always struggled with that a little bit because I was never able to clearly connect the dots between climate change um, and the health of my patients. But after I saw this patient, I realized that I had my you know, first patient story. Um, this was a 72 year old woman from Puerto Rico who came to our emergency department um, on a Sunday evening directly from Logan Airport um, requesting chemotherapy, medication refills and a psychiatric referral. This was soon after Hurricane Maria. Um, before Hurricane Maria, she had been diagnosed with lymphoma, which is um, a type of cancer involving the immune system and she was told she needed chemotherapy. She was able to get out of Puerto Rico and again, presented directly to our emergency department um, seeking medical care. And it occurred to me at that time that I had seen similar patients in the past, um, such as after Hurricane Katrina, when many um, patients from Louisiana relocated to our area. Um, but this was really the first time I connected the dots between climate change um, and one of my patients um, and the concept of climate refugees. Um, and those are people who need to leave their home and in this case, leave their healthcare. Um, and I think we need to be prepared to see, um, to, to care for similar patients as the climate crisis worsens and um, more people, including patients migrate and present to us seeking medical care. Um, so now we're going to talk about my third message, which is how the healthcare sector contributes to climate change. Um, the U.S. healthcare sector is responsible to 8.5 percent of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Um, 8.5 percent might not seem um, like a lot, um, but if you put it in perspective, um, the U.S. healthcare sector, if we were ranked as a nation, um, we would rank 13th in the world for emissions more than the entire United Kingdom. So we really do have a um, very large outsized carbon footprint. Um, I wanna just go back to the previous um, slide. I won't go back to it, but I wanna share information from it. We know that the US healthcare sector is responsible for 8.5% of US greenhouse gas emissions um, based on research um, done by um, Dr. Jody Sherman and Dr. Matt Eckelman, an emerging field of resource research called healthcare emissions research. Um, they recently published an update about the state of healthcare emissions in the United States. Um, and they found that in the past um, six years, healthcare emissions have actually risen. 
um, that they're the highest in per capita in the world. And then the majority of healthcare admissions come from the supply chain. Um, so all the medical devices and supplies and pharmaceuticals um, that are used to provide healthcare. Um, you know, just briefly want to um, put this in global perspective. Um, this is a study done by Healthcare Without Harm um, a couple of years ago. And we found that the United States is first in terms of the global um, healthcare climate footprint. We're responsible for 27% of the global healthcare footprint, which really is um, remarkable, but it also gives us an opportunity um, to you know, reduce our admissions, reduce our impact on the climate crisis and do so without impacting um, you know, healthcare quality or safety. Um, so you know, the two messages I want you to take from that is one, the United States has a very outsized um, climate footprint um, and the majority of those healthcare admissions come from our supply chain, all the stuff that we purchase in order to provide care. I think it's important to understand um, why healthcare's footprint is so large. Um, healthcare um, hospitals are very energy intensive. Um, we are the second most energy intensive um, buildings um, in the United States. We consume about, hospitals consume about three times more energy per square foot um, than other commercial buildings. Um, and energy, healthcare energy is very, very expensive, but this gives us lots of opportunity to promote energy efficiency um, and also to transition to renewable energy. Um, we've talked about this already. The healthcare supply chain is enormous. For any of you that work in healthcare, I encourage you uh, when you're in your clinics or on the floors um, to just pay attention at just how large the healthcare supply chain is. Um, the, the healthcare supply chain has come into focus um, recently at the start of the COVID pandemic when there was increased awareness about the healthcare sector's reliance on single-use disposables. I'm older. When I started in healthcare, we did not have single-use disposables. Um, most everything was sent to sterile processing, um, reprocessed, cleansed, and reused. But um, you know, over the years, we had more and more single-use disposables. And at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, there was increased awareness about this when there was critical when there were critical shortages of supplies um, such as PPE, um, including N95 masks and gowns. Um, I recall working one day and we had no gowns in my emergency department. We were out of gowns. But the silver lining is we have seen many hospitals, including my own, do things such as reprocess N95 masks, which is um, um, clean them, sterilize them, reprocess them for reuse, and we have transitioned to um, uh, reusable gowns. Um, hospitals are very wasteful, generating about 14,000 tons of waste per day. Um, that is uh, due to many reasons. Um, there's lots of plastic waste. ORs generate lots of waste. We have food waste. Um, we also have regulated medical waste, which is infectious waste. I think it's important to understand that there are many different waste streams in healthcare. Um, each different waste stream has different costs associated with it and also disposable, disposal methods and different environmental impacts. So as healthcare providers, I think it's important to understand that one, hospitals pay to dispose of their waste and that we can have a role um, in reducing healthcare waste by um, both re reducing our own wasteful practices and making sure that we segregate waste, um, waste properly. Um, the US healthcare sector is also very, or the worldwide, um, you know, healthcare is very, very pharmaceutical intensive, especially in the United States. Um, and we have some, you know, unique pharmaceuticals in healthcare, um, such as um, inhalers. Um, inhalers, the propellant used to make them um, be able to be, you know, sprayed and held into the lung um, is a greenhouse gas. Um, so inhalers have a unique carbon um, footprint. But I think 
what this does is give us as healthcare providers and clinicians opportunities to look at our, our pharmaceutical prescribing practices, make sure we are um, you know, not giving too many medications, not giving unnecessary medications, not giving too many um, refills, you know, understanding that pharmaceuticals make up a large portion of the healthcare's um, climate footprint. ORs have a particularly large impact despite their small physical footprint. They have an outsized carbon footprint. Um, the reasons for that are many, including that the OR has a very large and complex um, supply chain. Um, ORs are also very wasteful. They're very energy intensive because they require energy for cooling, lighting, and ventilation. Um, what's unique to operating rooms are anesthetic gases, which are the gases used to put patients to sleep sleep before a procedure um, and the commonly used inhalational um, anesthetic gases are all greenhouse gas of gases. Um, the most potent is desflurane, which has a global warming potential about 3000 times more um, than CO2. Um, so we are seeing more and more um, anesthesiologists um, become aware of the impact of their anesthetic choices and um, transitioning to um, anesthetic gases that are less potent than desflurane um, by either completely eliminating use of um, desflurane or reducing its use. Um, I wanna talk a little bit um, about clinician choices and how we can have a role and impact on climate change. Um, these are the three different um, scopes of emissions in healthcare. Scope one are emissions that are generated on site, such as on site energy generation, um, our fleet vehicles, our anesthetic gases. Scope two are purchase sources, and scope three is everything else. Um, as I said before, scope three is the makes up the largest percentage of healthcare emissions um, between 60 and 80%. Um, but I think if you look at what's included in scope three, it gives us an idea that we can really have an impact on scope three admissions by looking at how we prescribe pharmaceuticals, making sure we're making evidence-based decisions when we prescribe a medication, um, looking at how we um, reduce and segregate waste, um, looking at our choices when we choose um, a medical device, such as are we going to choose a um, reusable device or a single-use disposable advice, um, and we can look at how we commute. So I think as practicing clinicians, we really have an opportunity to have an impact on um, reducing healthcare admissions by focusing um, on our clinical practice and our choices. Uh, so um, I know that's a lot of information and it's quite overwhelming, um, but solutions do exist. So now I wanna talk about um, how we support the um, healthcare sector and create climate smart healthcare. Um, I first want to um, define climate smart healthcare. This is a term coined by Healthcare Without Harm and a World Bank and the World Bank in a report that we published several years ago. Um, climate smart healthcare is originally defined as low carbon resilient healthcare. And it is a series of data-driven evidence-based strategies for hospitals to reduce admissions and um, build climate ready resilient hospitals that can stay open and operational um, during extreme weather. Um, we do this in a variety of ways. I work for the Healthcare Without Harm Climate and Health Program, which supports um, the US healthcare sector in a three pillar strategy, mitigation, resilience, and leadership. We work with hospitals to reduce their carbon footprint, um, to build climate smart, resilient hospitals and to mobilize the healthcare sector's ethical, economic, and political influence to advance climate solutions, um, both inside the four walls of the hospital and outside. Uh, we also do this by um, partnering with some of our other program areas. Um, we work very closely with our Healthy Food and Healthcare 
um, program um, I didn't mention before, but um, the food industry has a very, very large climate footprint, um, especially animal agriculture. Um, and we work with hospitals um, sort of in a three pillar um, climate friendly food strategy approach, um, work with hospitals to serve less meat um, and better meat such as locally sourced um, grass fed um, meat, um, working with hospitals to reduce food waste and also on sustainable um, uh, food purchasing. Um, the Cool Food Pledge, um, is one of our programs um, which helps healthcare facilities serve um, plant-centered um, plant food um, while reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have a number of healthcare facilities um, uh, participating in our Cool Food Pledge. Um, we also do it through our US-based membership organization, Practice Green Health. Um, which is a networking organization for um, hospitals and health systems interested in promoting sustainable health care um, and um, delivering environmental solutions. Um, each of those circles is um, one of Practice Green Health's impact areas, such as energy, food, climate, the OR. And Practice Green Health has a number of toolkits, um, resources, networking opportunities, and educational events um, to help hospitals implement sustainable health care. Um, I often get asked um, if sustainable health care is expensive, and um, the opposite is true. The business case for sustainable health care is very, very strong. Um, um, with demonstrated cost savings. Um, this is data from our annual awards um, program, which is a data-driven award application, which allows us to you know, understand the, the state of um, sustainable healthcare in the US. Um, and um, we were able to determine that hospitals that implemented um, waste reduction, um, energy efficiency, meat reduction product, product projects, um, and initiatives in the operating room saved on average of $1.1 million a year and $47,000 per operating room. And there's not an administrator um, in the country whose ears aren't gonna perk up at hearing um, those kind of cost savings. Um, but the cost savings is not the only um, you know, business um, advantage to sustainable healthcare. Um, we know that hospitals that make a commitment to um, sustainability can have um, improved community reputation and also improved employee um, retention, recruitment, and engagement. So I think it's important to know the business case for sustainable healthcare is very strong. We also get it done by engaging clinicians. So, you know, so why do we engage clinicians? Um, um, and I feel very strongly that sustainable health care is really in working in keeping with the oath to do no harm, um, which physicians, um, you know, take um, at medical school graduation. Of course, we want to make sure that we don't harm our patients, but I think we also have an obligation to make sure that our healthcare operations are not causing environmental degradation, contributing to the climate crisis and ultimately contributing to the diseases we treat. Um, we also know that healthcare professionals are trusted. Um, nurses year after year are the most trusted um, profession based on the Gallup poll. Um, medical doctors have come up on the list. Um, we're now more trusted and you see um, pharmacists um, are also trusted. So we really can leverage that trust um, that the public has in us uh, um, to um, communicate how climate change is impacting health and how taking action on climate change um, can um, provide health benefits. Um, medical societies are increasingly um, calling on health professionals to take action. A number of US-based medical societies, such as American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Physicians, um, American College of Emergency Physicians have put out position papers and policy statements calling on um, their members 
um, to take climate action um, through education, advocating for public policies that advance climate solutions, and also to lead action to reduce the climate footprint of healthcare delivery. And we also know that clinicians are health experts and they can be you know, powerful health advocates and really um, you know, leverage that to um, advance climate solutions by making the connection between climate action and improved public health. So how do we support clinicians? Um, we do that in a variety of ways. Um, the Nurses Climate Challenge is a national campaign. Um, in partnership with Healthcare Without Harm and the Alliance of Nurses for a Healthy Environment. It's a campaign to mobilize nurses to educate 50,000 um, healthcare professionals on the impacts of climate change on human health by 2020. Um, for those of you in the audience who are, who are nursing students, um, you're welcome to join. They provide many um, resources and how-to guides. It's a great community. I encourage you to join. Um, for those of you um, who know nurses, I would also encourage them um, to join. Um, I lead the Healthcare Without Harm Physician Network, which is a growing national network of medical students and physicians who are interested in reducing the environmental impact of healthcare delivery and advancing climate smart healthcare and other climate solutions. Um, for those of you who are medical students, um, you know, I encourage you to join. Everyone else, I encourage you to um, um, reach out to medical students and physicians and um, welcome them to join this network. It's free, it's no obligation, um, and it's really a great community. Um, so how can profession health professionals take action? Um, I think we have opportunity to take actions you know, as individuals, as community um, members, as clinicians, as in hospital employees. Um, through my work with the Physician Network, this is how we, um, these are sort of the buckets of how physicians can take action um, as individuals within the hospital or health system, within your clinical practice, as researchers, educators, you know, advocates. Um, and through engaging the media. Um, so the examples of how you can do that, you know, as individuals, you can look at your lifestyle and um, consumer choices, you know, what kind of car do you buy? What kind of food do you buy? Um, um, I think one of the most important things you can do as an individual is talk about climate, um, you know, join a group. Within the hospital or health system, you could, um, ask your administrator to um, make a commitment to sustainable health care by either joining Practice Green Health or joining the Healthcare Climate Challenge, um, starting a green team, um, leading a department project, um, reaching out to your food service director um, and encourage them to um, serve local sustainable food, including you know, plant forward food. Um, you can look at your clinical practice um, by looking at your you know, device and pharmaceutical choices, how you segregate and reduce waste. Um, you can also educate patients through discharge instructions um, and at the bedside. Um, many, many research gaps and opportunities for health professionals to engage in research, which better helps us better understand um, healthcare admissions, which ultimately provides us um, with um, data so that we can make evidence-based, um, you know, clinical and device use choices. Um, we can engage the media um, through the media by writing letters to the editors, op-eds, op blogs, um, podcasts, interviews, um, many ways to engage the media, including on social media. Um, many ways to incorporate this um, information into education um, through conferences, um, you know, community education, um, educations within your school, um, and many opportunities to um, advocate for public policies that promote climate solutions, um, such as meeting with legislators, providing testimonies, um, and joining one of the many state clinician climate action groups. Um, so what are some easy things you can do now? Um, you can get educated. Um, um, there are many websites you can um, get educated through. I encourage you to check out the Practice Green Health and Healthcare Without Harm websites. If you're interested in this, um, sign up for one of our many newsletters. 
Um, we have a climate and health newsletter. We have a healthy food and healthcare um, newsletter, but a very easy way to get um, very digestible um, education delivered to you. Um, you know, connect with the sustainability community. Um, if you're a nursing student, join the Nurses Climate Challenge. If you're a medical student, I invite you to um, join our physician network. Um, there's a lot of power in joining a group um, and connecting with other people who share your interests. And I think there's, um, you know, we're stronger together than we are alone. Um, if you're in the healthcare setting, look around for impacts and opportunities. Once you start seeing the environmental impact of healthcare delivery, you're not going to start stop seeing it. And talk about this. Um, you know, talk about this, um, you know, with your professors. And if you're doing clinical rotations, um, you know, talk about um, climate smart healthcare, um, you know, during rounds. If you're going on a medical school interview, um, you know, ask, um, you know, is your hospital or health system engaged around climate action? Um, do you have a greenhouse gas reduction goal? Do you have a climate action plan? Um, is your facility committed to this? Um, and, you know, just, you know, commit to one, one action. Um, just briefly, I want to say that um, if you are interested in this, um, Clean Med is our annual conference. It's coming up um, May 8th to 20th, it's going to be held virtually. Um, we have great student pricing. Um, student pricing is $49 for the three-day conference. Um, even if you're not able to attend the conference, um, registrants will have access to the recordings and networking platform through the end of the year. We have a number of students um, already signed up for Clean Med and are opening um, talk is going to be a student-led session, um, including um, a medical student, pharmacy student, nursing student, and a Master of Healthcare Administration student. Um, so it's going to be a great way to kick off our conference, and I encourage any students to um, take advantage of that great student pricing and join us. Um, I just want to close a little bit and talk about hope and how far we've come, especially over the past couple of years. When I first started doing this um, work, I was alone. Um, I didn't have a community. Um, you know, I felt sort of isolated. Um, but over the past couple of years, um, the momentum has really grown and more and more physicians and medical students and other health professionals are recognizing how climate change is going to impact health and the importance of um, health professionals um, leading action. And I'm just so inspired about how, especially um, during the COVID crisis, that the community of health professionals that I'm engaged with really continues to um, be engaged in this work and um, lead climate action. Uh, no one inspires me more than the emerging healthcare leaders, um, the students. Um, Medical Students for a Sustainable Future is a student group that was born out of our physician network. It has grown to be a highly successful, visionary, productive um, group of medical students. I encourage any medical students to connect with them um, because they really are terrific. Um, and we've seen similar groups form of pharmacy students. The Sustainable Pharmacy um, Project is out of Virginia Commonwealth um, University, and it's a group of pharmacy students working to integrate education about the environmental impact of pharmaceuticals um, into pharmacy education and to broadly um, educate the pharmacy community. We're also seeing a similar, uh, we've seen a similar group form with Masters of Healthcare Administration students trying to integrate education about sustainable healthcare into their curriculum. Um, I just want to um, close by, um, you know, talking about how I got started and where we are now. Um, you know, my son first asked me to take climate action back in 2007. It's 2000, it's 14 years later. Um, and the youth are still asking um, adults to take climate action. We've come far, but we still have a long way to go. Um, I think, you know, when people ask me what individual action 
um, you know, I'm most proud of. I think I'm most proud of raising an environmentally responsible son. Um, but I think I could also argue that my environmentally responsible son raised me. Um, and I just want to close by talking about one action, you know, never think that one action is not going to lead to something and never, um, you know, let that fear stop you from doing something. You know, this was one teacher who um, broke curriculum and read her students a story about climate change and polar bears who inspired one little boy who inspired one mom and I was able to inspire my CEO who was then able to um, inspire our entire healthcare system to make a commitment to sustainable healthcare. Um, and it ultimately led to this physician movement. So, you know, I encourage all of you to find your one thing. You can all do one thing and never think that it's not going to lead to something bigger. And with that, I'm going to close. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. I appreciate that broad overview and all the actions we can take, as well as mentioning all the groups that people can get a, yeah. be a part of. I think that's really valuable. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions or if you can feel free to uh, put it in the chat box, but you can also unmute yourself and ask a question as well. And I'll go ahead and start with the question I had. So one of the things I wanted to mention, because you know, sometimes even when I talk about climate change here on campus, I get scoffed at or just that it's seen as a political issue and not necessarily a health issue. So what would you say to people who it as a political issue, not necessarily health. I, mean, I think we know that um, health and politics are very closely intertwined. That has never become more clear than during the COVID crisis. Um, I, when I get that sort of feedback, I immediately, um, you know, speak as a physician and I go right to the response of the healthcare sector. I talk about how the impacts of climate change and health have now become mainstream in the health community. We are seeing, um, you know, um, literature, um, you know, in our journals about climate change and health. Um, um, I think 31 medical societies um, in the United States have joined the Medical Society Consortium on Climate Change and Health. Um, which is a coalition of um, uh, medical societies trying to mobilize um, U.S. physicians to advocate for climate policy solutions. Um, you know, and as I said during my talk, many of these medical societies have issued policy statements. So I really say, you know what, you know, I'm a physician and I get my information about health from my medical societies and from our medical journals. They are concerned about the health impacts of, um, of climate change. Um, you know, and I really bring it about health and where I get my information and the health experts. That's great, thank you. Anyone have any questions? All right, another question I had is, if you could give a student, whether it's a medical student or say pharmacy or PA, PTA, one piece of advice as they embark on their rotations and their future career, what would you tell them? Um, I think one, talk about this. Um, you can be the experts on this. Um, and I think what I tell students all the time is never under underestimate your power. I think students are really, really powerful um, so never, you know, underestimate that um, and really sort of leverage that power. Um, and that is just so clear, um, having seen what Medical Students for a Sustainable Future has accomplished in the 18 months since they formed. They are a force. They are an international force. Um, you know, so I guess, you know, you know own your power. Okay. And, you know, you can also, um, you know, educate your, you know, professors and, um, you know, colleagues. You can be very powerful educators, too. That's great. So we have right. another question. Dogs barking, so. Uh, that's fine. We had another question. They said, regarding single-use single, single use items used in the hospitals, how do you balance the need for sustainability with that of infection control and prevention? Yeah, that's a very big question. Um, there is research around that. Um, the whole trend towards um, single-use disposable was really driven by 
um, concern about infection control. Um, there is some evidence and that has found that that is really not a, you know, a necessarily a valid concern um, that um, devices can be reused and there can and maintain infection control. Um, so it, it's more of a perceived fear than a valid fear, but more research is needed. Okay. Are there resources on the practice greenhouse or healthcare without harm that they can dive deeper into that topic? I can share some of the um, um, research around that. Um, that research has been led um, largely by Dr. Jody Sherman, who was the author of the Health Affairs paper where um, you know, she found that the U.S. healthcare sector is responsible for 8.5% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. She speaks widely on this topic. Um, I could share some of her presentations. She does a much better job and much more articulately than I just did. Um, and I can also share some of her, um, her publications. Uh, it's a very common question I get from student audiences. So I think it's great that there's awareness. Yes, probably the especially whole, now yeah. with COVID. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes. All right. Any other questions anyone had? All right. I just want to remind everybody we'll be able to send out information Dr. Collins mentioned as well as the video recording. But Dr. Collins, I just want to thank you so much for being here and oh, thank for you. presenting this to our university in our area. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Please be in touch okay. if you have questions.